Hi, beautiful family. Hi to you all. Oh my goodness, guys. This is going to be such a special time. Hi, everybody. I can see loads of people that I know. Oh, I love it. I love it. I love it. In the natural. I know you're by the spirit, right? So, okay, get comfortable, get prepared. We, of course, have the amazing Justin Abraham with us, and we're going to go somewhere really, really special today. Just, um, but just as, as just as we're beginning, before I hand over to Justin, I just want to read you guys. It's connected to some of what Justin's going to bring today. I just want to read you a quote from Spurgeon because I was reading a book. I've just done a, done a show recently with Charlie Champ and it's in his new book. So I was just going bouncing through his book as we were talking, you know, and preparing for the show. And this really jumped out at me. Just listen to this really quickly. So this is Spurgeon's perspective with regards to the, cl the cloud of witnesses and the realm of heaven and glory, right? He says, the inhabitants of heaven and believers on earth might seem to be two orders of being, yet in truth, they are one family. To this thought, I call your attention, hoping that you may enter into that one communion in which saints above are bound up with saints below in the indissoluble, soluble, <laughs> sorry, kinship in Christ, which holds us as much as ever in one sacred unity. Isn't that amazing? One family in heaven on earth, right? So as we're beginning and I hand over to Justin, I just pray for a fresh grace on all of us that our eyes would be freshly flooded with light, that any restrictive box that we've been living in that restricts our movements, restricts our visibility would be completely broken free today as Justin shares from his powerful relationship with Jesus. <laughs> And we go to a completely different place of visibility regarding who we are and actually where we already live and the, the realm of the kingdom that is our home, right? is the reality we live in. So I will see you all at the end. Justin, it's so amazing to have you with us. I'm going to hand over. Thank you, Liz. It's good to be back with this mm. amazing community. And, I, you know, I speak highly of you, Liz, all the time when people message me and say, where can I go for mentoring and finding that? support i always recommend you guys because mm. there's a lot of love on this and love is the frequency of the next age it is the yeah. next age rising it is perfection we're made complete in love so love is the logic of heaven and when we function in the logic of heaven we function in love so it's good to be with you all and i'm excited about today's topic maybe just for a minute, because I know we're all busy and we're doing stuff and we're all going about our day. Let's do a, a recollection activation. So recollection is an old Christian term. It means recollect yourself, not around the outside, but around the inside where Jesus already dwells, the Trinity already dwells. It's called the prayer of centering. The inside of you is a burning flame. It's always there. And as you turn your attention into it, you unify with it. And you begin to experience mystical communion with the divine nature, which is already within you. So let's do that now. So put your feet on the floor comfortably and relax your face. Sit up kind of straight, but relax. And one of the ways I engage often is just letting go of everything else. So your mind will want to do lots of things, but it doesn't have to right now. In this moment, there is perfection right now. It's a beautiful moment. So I'll say things like that. I'll say, this is a beautiful moment. And I'll just breathe in. Breathe in the essence of life. Because remember, the ruach, the breath, is life. And we just very gently turn our awareness within. And we drink the sweetness like a bee going on the, on the flowers, you just drink from that pollen and that sweetness. And like a buzzy bee, you just allow yourself to get covered in it, covered in the pollen, covered in the sweetness, and you feast, taste and see that the Lord is good. So all the realms of the spirit start through tasting his love and his joy, not through striving. This is in the realm of striving. It's, it's accepting, receiving a kingdom. Woo! 
So I design my own mantras or charts or meditations. And what, what I like to say is this. I say to the Lord, I'm in you. And I just lean slightly forwards. I'm in you. And you're in me. And I lean back. I love you. Just lean in. You love me. Wow. Breathe in. Breathe out. Breathe in like the waves crashing over you. Waves of love. That every breath you are drawing the sea of love in. And you are letting go. Casting all your cares upon him. And you are in oneness. Oneness. Enfolded. Enveloped. Wrapped up. You are in the cloud. You're a cloud rider. And you can just begin to ascend in that cloud. There's a very natural pull towards heaven and you become a cloud rider, you just ride on that love and your spirit just gets bigger and bigger and bigger. You go higher and you just stretch out now. You can almost stretch your arms if you want, just stretch out and enjoy the space that you are in the wide open spaces of love. There's more than enough room for you to grow, to be, to enjoy. When you're in that realm now, you could just open up your senses. And it's very, very natural for you to sense that realm because you're from that realm. You're from that realm. You're birthed from that realm. Wow. You might feel right now just almost like God's presence resting on your head, that's normal. Just allow that expansion to happen. It's very natural. <sighs> it's beautiful. This is called abiding under the shadow of the Almighty. In the shelter of the Most High. Beyond Earth. Beautiful. Okay, very gently, come back with me now and just breathe again. Take a deep breath. Oh, just feel your body again in the room you're in, your feet on the floor. And just very gently come out of that realm again. And we'll just be together now for this next 50 minutes. Isn't that refreshing? And it's very simple, isn't it? And, you know... What we did there was so ancient. It goes back even to Genesis, I think, chapter six, which said they called on the name of the Lord. And that word called there means they murmured or groaned or chanted and entangled into God. And in the old covenant, it's called devakut or binding yourself to the Lord. So those who wait on the Lord or the word wait there means bind or entangle. It's actually the root word entangle. So those who entangle in the Lord will renew their strength. They will run. So there's an energy on this sweetness. Now, the modern charismatic church has been taught to really pull on heaven, shout, blow shofars and war and all that. And that, there is a place for that at times, but not most of the time, the rhythm should be simplicity. It should be easy and light and it should be union. So we're a generation of, of ecstatics that are rediscovering the ancient path, that this was the way they walked from the very beginning. Enoch walked arm in arm with the Lord. That's what it means. It says Enoch walked with God. Now, you guys know this already. I've, I've shared this, but Enoch's a person that I have encountered in the spirit. And what Enoch communicated to me through infused knowledge, through light, was this. That he walking with God, he decided every day I want to tune into the awareness of his presence. So Enoch chose every day to awaken into it 
and and turn his mind back to it and his heart back to it and he lived his whole life it says 365 years he walked with god so he chose every day i'm going to live in union every day i'm going to be arm in arm and god enjoyed it so much that he would give him raptures and ecstasies over and over again so that's what i want to talk about today and i might even share some of enoch's encounters i want to talk about ecstasies and raptures because this is a topic that's very, very important. When you study church history, and even the birthing of the church came from Pentecost, where the love wine was uncontainable. They couldn't contain it. They, they stumbled out on the streets. And the fruit of the love wine and the ecstasy was that Peter became an oracle. And when he spoke, 3,000 people believed because of the frequency that he carried from the ecstasy. And he would be a person who lived in ecstasy. Peter said he fell into a trance on the rooftops. He'd have encounters. He'd know mystical secrets. And, you know, Peter's shadow, he had a realm, a frequency coming off his body, which they called the shadow. But really it was his spirit being so expanded that anyone that stood in that bubble when he came out of the gatherings would be healed. And it actually says that they lined the streets they lined this wow this is coming again this is coming again what's coming is is going to shock and bring awe and wonder to the world i've seen it and my role today is to be a messenger of the future a messenger of the face and i'm telling you what's coming with an invitation into it because you've been called into the ecstasy you've been called into raptures we're coming back into the age of trances again Trances is a biblical word. Ecstasis, ecstasy, trances are throughout the Bible. There would be no book of Revelation if John hadn't gone wrapped in the spirit. There would be no Peter's, uh, Paul's gospel if he hadn't been hijacked to paradise. There would be no visions of Ezekiel if he hadn't been caught up and taken out of his body in visions of God where the hand of the Lord came upon him. There would be no Isaiah, no Jeremiah. There would be no... Um, there would be no Torah from Moses if there wasn't ecstasies and he went up on the mountain and saw visions of God and saw Genesis. There would be no Enochian way if Enoch hadn't walked with God and gone into these realms. There would have never been the Desert Fathers movement or the Huguenots or the Celtic saints. The history of Christianity is the history of ecstasy. You cannot separate them. We were known for the wine. Even today, they still have some of the hymns from the first century. It's called the Ode of Solomon. And in there, they say, your, your love is like a wine that intoxicates me. So even in the first century, even in the earliest time of the church, they were singing songs about inebriation, intoxication, because this is why Jesus came. And he said, the new covenant is wine. The new covenant is wine. It's not rules. It's a drink. It's a feast. It's not more, more mitzvahs. We have mitzvahs in the old covenant. In the new covenant, it's a wine explosion. It's a radical love explosion. It's mystic union. It's oneness. It's the new Adam. The old Adam was side by side with God. The new Adamic kainos species are in oneness with the Trinity. And their joy is your joy. Their life is your life. Their strength is your strength. Whoa. And we should not be surprised by this. But religion is the cult of grumpy. How do we know this? From the book of Galatians. In the book of Galatians, uh, one translation says this. Paul, Paul knows something's happened to them because there's this one line. He said, who stole your joy? Who stole your joy? Who came in and stole it? Who stole your ecstasies? Who stole your raptures? Something's gone on with you, Galatians. You're not whacked anymore. You're not enjoying the mystical union that you have. And then he has to explain the law to them versus grace. It's so powerful. But much of the modern church is bewitched by law, trying to be good enough, trying to work hard enough, trying to sing the right song, pray the right way, do the right repentance, rather than living in Christ, in union, in his perfection. That's the gospel that we live in his perfection not having a righteousness of my own, but one that comes by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. 
So Paul lived in this. Paul wrote more about ecstasies. He used the word ecstasy, ecstasis more than anyone, anyone in the Bible. He was an ecstatic. He said, if I'm out of my mind, it's for God's glory. And the word he used there, ecstasy, means out of my normal stasis. If I'm out of my stasis, if I'm out of my mind, if I'm in ecstasy, the root is ecstasis. If I'm blissfully unaware of all of you in the room he says this incredible line in corinthians he says it's for god god delights in my ecstasy but he says if i'm sober and if i'm sane i'm doing it for you so paul lived in the in the contradiction of being absorbed by the gospel i mean he even went into the wilderness for many many years and encountered god in ecstasies and raptures he got all of his revelation from above he said i don't look at what is seen because it's temporary. I look at the unseen and the eternal, and I look in the realm, and I've seen it. I've been there. I know a man who was even hijacked into paradise, so sometimes he didn't even have a choice. He was choiceless. He said, the love which Christ has for me, this is in Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, he says, the love that Christ has for me possesses me on every side, constrains me, and leaves me no choice. He said, the very spring of every action I do is God's love for me which one translation says it vibrates it's a frequency that possesses me and he says because I've seen it he says I'm persuaded I've had a revelation I've had a realization that there's a new creation and that one died for all therefore all died in him and I can't look at anyone woo-hoo, in a human fashion so you guys okay? I just saw a question pop up. What does an ecstasy look like? So we're going to get into that. Now, I probably can't cover the whole thing in this one talk, but I'm going to give you, I'm going to throw stuff out with you. And I, I'm hoping you'll go, yeah, I'm having it. I'm having it. This is a feast. The gospel is a feast. It's a love feast. It's a wedding feast. It's a banquet. It's how much do you want? You know, and I think the problem with the modern church is we're trying to press in for it rather than feast in. I see massive stuff happen in my life because I believe Christ has come. Christ in me, the hope of glory. And it, whoa, someone's saying I'm having it. It's popping up on the screen. <laughs> Guys, if you want to encourage me as I'm speaking, bear in my heart, just pop it up on the screen. So what does an ecstasy look like? Psalm 1611, and I'm going to go through other scriptures now. In your presence is fullness of joy and total satisfaction. At your right hand are endless pleasures and eternal delights. So ecstasis is somebody that's gone beyond just the mere edges of the ocean. They have plunged into it. They've dived into it. They've been swallowed up by it and they are lost in love. And an ecstasy is a moment where that happens for you so much that you're caught up and you may not even know what's going on in the room. You might be, they might p- touch you and you're not coming round. It depends on how strong it is, but you're in a state of deep, deep union with God. So in the stages of prayer, the early stages, the prayer recollection, where we turn into his presence we begin to enjoy it. Then we go into simple union or the prayer of silence or the prayer of affection. This is where you're not saying much because you're starting to taste. You're going, oh, wow, wow. And church culture rarely goes there. It stays in the the prayer of recollection. Now the prayer of recollection is beautiful. There's nothing wrong with it, but it's the entry to these other layers of God. So If you allow recollection to keep going and you keep the music going, you keep engaging, you'll eventually be like this. And it's almost like the yum yum begins. So I have like a kind of yum yum. It's called the prayer of affection because now it's about the heart, not intellect. Your heart is strangely warmed. You're just knowing the love of God that surpasses understanding and you're beginning to experience him. Now, I go there every day. That's my home. Why wouldn't I? I love it. And I sit in his presence, you know, where the presence itself becomes the prayer. I'm quoting Jean Goyon. She said that the French mystic. So then next you're enjoying a gentleness, but then this is ecstasy. Ecstasy is where it starts to kind of go upwards and out. So you're enjoying God, but now, now your mind awakens suddenly from its sleep. And you're starting to see visions of God and the Trinity or time and space, but it's very strong. So it's not a light vision where you're just kind of looking. You are really getting absorbed by it and enjoying it. And it it can be you can have a mild ecstasy, which you can pull out of. 
but you may take a while, but you, or you can have a strong ecstasy. Strong ecstasies are much harder to pull out of. An example of that is Daniel, where he, he said he was sick for seven days after one of his ecstasies. He was totally out of it. Mariah Wood of Theta used to get that, where she would take days sometimes to come out. She'd go translucent. Glory would break out. Presence would break out. She had one meeting that lasted six weeks. She was in ecstasy for the whole time. She only spoke for the first hour, then the glory broke out. She went translucent and the whole city was transformed. The lawyers came, the doctors came, the judges came and revival broke out for miles around. And she just lied on the floor. It caught up in the spirit looking translucent. Evan Roberts was another one. Evan Roberts was often caught up in trances and ecstasies. In fact, he went through a season of three months of ecstasies, he writes in his journal, where at night, twice a night, for three hours at a time, he would be taken up. And he said, I saw the face of God. Woo! Woo! How are we doing so far? Amazing. All good? It's a good topic? Okay. So... <laughs> Ecstasy is a stronger state of bliss. I'll just write, here's four points for you on what ecstasy. It's usually a very strong union presence. So you, you know you're in union, and now it's got really strong. It's like, oh, I'm in union. You might cry or laugh, your affections are warmed, okay? It's like, sometimes can feel like anesthetic. It starts off gentle, um, in the stronger states, is very strong anesthetic, and I've had that many, many times. Point two, you enter into an expanded state of wonder and revelation. So you're, you're getting knowledge, but also mystery. True ecstasies always have an element of both. You're getting knowledge, but the more knowledge you get, the more questions you have, because God's just blown the grid for you, and now you're thinking differently, so you have new questions. I'll give you an example. Let's say when John saw the seven spirits. He's having a revelation of the seven spirits before the throne, right? Well, now the questions are, well, what are the seven spirits? How do they function? How do I engage them? So true, yeah, revelation always brings mystery. So we're not in the age where you're trying to get to the end of mystery. You want more mystery. Mystery shows where you grow. Revelation is what you know. Mystery is where you grow. So you always have to hold them in attention. Now, the modern church culture doesn't like that. I get people message me every single day wanting questions answered rather than engage in the mystery and the beauty of the mystery and the affair of the mystery and the sweetness of the mystery. woo Yee-hee! If there's one thing to know what a flower's like and know the details of it and have a response. There's another thing to smell that flower, feel that flower, engage that flower. And that is exactly what it's like. OK, physically, ecstasies can be overwhelming, but over time you can get more used to them. In the early days when I first started having them, about 15 or 16 years ago, I found them quite overwhelming. I didn't know what to do. So I just lie down sometimes for two hours and just come round and eat food to come out of it and carry on with my day. Um, now I can actually have quite strong ones and come back very quickly as well because it's like I'm used to the protocol. I'm used to how it feels. I'm used to how it, how it functions. Wow. Whoa. So the fourth element of ecstasy is that it's mysterious and fearful. You see that God is always bigger than you thought. It wrecks you. You thought this way, now you don't anymore. It's like, oh my gosh, I'm going to have to rethink my theology. I'm going to have to think, rethink my theology on the cosmos, on the saints, on heaven and hell, dimensions, realms, all of it. It challenges your current thinking and it's actually teshuva, which I talked about last time which is the word for repentance in the Old Testament. Teshuva, teshuv, hey, means return to the wonder. Hey is the wonder. Hey is yod, hey, vav, hey, God's name. And the symbol for hey is somebody in wonder. So there's a pictograph for it, which is a man or woman with their arms open like that. That's hey. So they're going like, hey, wow, whoa, wow, woohoo. 
See, we're coming into that age, guys, where we're going to have so many revelations and expansions in the same way that computers have expanded, Google, Twitter, Facebook and technology, quantum physics. We're having a spiritual awakening. We're going to see things that no eye has seen, no ear has heard. We're going from glory to glory, strength to strength. The mystical story has not ended. You are you are the ones that have been called to pioneer it and take it beyond where it's been, understanding how to shift, move, transfigure all. All these things are in that realm even bend in space time i've had um, miracles with time time miracles when i've had ecstasies and time's bent round my ecstasy and i've even had one time where i had one where time went back a whole hour and i had the hour back again so even though i'd used the hour uh, the clocks went back and time went back <laughs> So that's called redeem in the time. So if you want a scripture, I've got a scripture for everything I'm speaking on. Redeem the time. That means take the power of time and use it. So there you go. Time is a power. Now, the Blue Letter Bible and the Bible dictionaries describe ecstasy as this. They use the masculine but feminine as well. A man who by some sudden emotion is transported. So there's a sudden emotion. And you're transported, as it were, out of himself, so that in this rapt condition, he is awake. Although he's awake, so you're not asleep, his mind is drawn off from all surrounding objects and wholly fixed on things divine. Wow. So I'll tell you now, that's true, that definition, but not quite true, because there's degrees of ecstasy. You can have a mild one where you can kind of pull out of it if you want, or stronger ones. If you keep going, they are very hard to pull out of. They get so inebriating, so intoxicating. And you can see those in every move of God. Um, I'll give you an example. In the Brownsville revival, the pastor and his wife, I heard this from Lyndall Cooley, they, for three months, they were in ecstasies. They had to be carried out of the meetings and put into bed as the glory was breaking out. The same thing happened in Toronto. We served in Toronto for five months. Carol Arnott would have frequent ecstasies. And on the first night it broke out, she had an ecstasy where she was swinging a sword. And John Arnott didn't know what to do. And he almost shut it down. But the Lord said to him afterwards, if you shut down Carol, you would never have had the awakening in Toronto that changed Christianity. So that's how much God honours ecstasies god really really honors ecstasies he would have shut down the toronto outpouring in the 90s if john arnott had shut down carol when she was in her ecstasy that's how much god values ecstasies it's the same with the pensacola pensacola three million people got saved but the pastor and his wife and lindell cool he said this the worship leader they were out of it for three months they were even drooling they were even drooling that's how strong they were in it. So anyway, there's questions popping up, Liz. Do we, should I keep teaching or answer yeah, questions or are you great. happy? Yeah, it's amazing, amazing. Yeah. <laughs> keep so going, keep, Justin. Yeah, keep going, it's is wonderful. It? Yeah, yeah, keep going, keep going. I'm happy to do more sessions on this if you want me back anytime, because I feel like this is a very important message yeah, for this generation. We have to really restore really the wonder is. and the ecstasy. And it's so <laughs> biblical. Okay, so yeah. Teresa of Avila, one of my favorite saints, beautiful, incredible woman. I've read her books for, for the last decade. She described ecstasy as this. Are you ready? It's called an excessive gladness and delight, which is so extreme that the soul appears to swoon away and seems on the point of leaving the body. Wow. Yeah. I've had that many times where you swoon away. And you seem to be at the point of leaving the body. And it's a very unusual thing. And um, you have to deal with fear issues, trust issues, love issues. Where am I going to go? Can I trust God? Am I safe? <laughs> am I going to die? You go through all those triggers in you. And I've had to deal with all those triggers in my life and gone before the Lord and say, forgive me for not trusting you with my body, not trusting you with my spirit, wherever you want to go. I, I, and, and not being willing to go into the unknown, you know, because often God's taking you into the great unknown. Mm -hmm. Or as they wrote in church history, the cloud of unknowing. Woohoo! OK, so for me, um, I have ecstasies regularly. Um, uh, but but not all the time. I, I, I say I'd have probably a very strong one, um, maybe once a month or so. I don't know. I don't know what the frequency is. 
but I, I, I do have them. Um, I, I've learned how to function in them. I've learned how to engage them. I've learned how to lean into them and make room for them. It's, they called it the science of ecstasy and the science of mysticism. So you can learn the science of the unseen. And in fact, when I was a young man, that's what I asked the Lord. I said, I want to know the science of the unseen. And if you ask God something like that, he'll teach you it. He will teach you how to engage, how to turn in, how to open your heart, how to expand, how to ascend, how to go into other dimensions, how to flow with him. He wants to give you those. This is good pleasure to give you the kingdom but will you receive it and the problem with our modern church is we're always praying for god to do something god come god revive us god move god act and you don't really see those prayers in those old mystic saints they believed god had come that was paul's gospel christ has come and he lived in union so yeah god can come more in the room but I think we need to change the language and realize what the gospel actually is. The gospel is the merger between you and God into one new being. That changes everything. How can I ask God to come when he is intrinsically entangled into me and I in him? And that's the gospel. Okay, so they can be stronger then. There's a stronger state again called rapture. Now I'm using old church language. This has been written about throughout the centuries. I'm not making up new terms. They called it ecstasy and they called it rapture. Now rapture is different from ecstasy in this regard. Ecstasy kind of like you can gently swirl into it like a gentle whirlwind taking you up, taking you up and it gets stronger and stronger. So you're like an eagle rising. Rapture only comes on people who practice union. Rapture is a sudden, on, this is a definition, sudden onslaught of the divine. So the difference with rapture is this, if you've got, if you're walking arm in arm with God, like Enoch and all these other saints, and you're loving Jesus every day, you, he takes that as you've given him permission to surprise you occasionally. So a rapture is a sudden 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 capture in a way by god so paul writes about this he says i know a man who 14 years ago was seized by christ so this is where the love of god this is what you've got to get guys we're not trying to make this happen god wants this to happen he wants to ravish you out of your senses he wants to feast on you he wants to smell the garden be in the garden he wants you but the problem is we resist him and we, we don't understand the nature of our relationship. The, re, re, the nature of our relationship is this. He is the wildfire lover and he wants to consume you on the altar of his love. But very few people want that for whatever reason. Maybe religion told them they couldn't have it. Maybe they were shut down. I don't know, but I believe it's changing now. This community is evidence of that. Other communities like Nancy Cohen's community is evidence of that global ascension network and others the the story's changing the language is changing we're not afraid of mysticism in this generation we're embracing it okay so Paul said I was seized by Christ and swept in ecstasy to the heights of heaven so do you see the language he's using this is like I was swept up I was caught up God grabbed me and I really don't know if this took place in the body on or out of it. So this is where you get into really, really strong states. Now I've had these, they are quite scary. Raptures are scary, okay? But that's okay, just embrace it. You can see Daniel got scared. Even John fell like dead. Daniel fell like dead. Raptures, the strong end of it, are really like overwhelming, but so powerful, wonderful. He said, I don't know if this took place in the body or out of it. Now, when you go into these kind of realms, like John on the Isle of Patmos, he says, I was wrapped in spirit. It doesn't matter whether you're in the body or not. You've broken the membrane so much that you're functioning in both. It's gone. The veil's open and you're in. Um, he says, only God knows. <laughs> so he didn't know whether his body left the room now i know some people's bodies have left the room i know a guy that when he has ecstasies he part departiculates that's a word he came up with but this even happened to john paul jackson john paul jackson had one ecstasy where he woke up in the night being pulled up by angels up into the lord he looks down and he could see the bed his body wasn't on the bed and John Paul said, I knew at that moment my body was going with me. So it is possible for your body to go as well. Ooh, 
<laughs> so rapture, this is beautiful. It says, I know that this man was hijacked into paradise. So what is paradise in Hebraic? It means the full supply of God. It means the gimel, the fullness. I was in the expanse. I was in the fullness of all that it is. So, wow, that's where Paul got his gospel from. He says, I didn't get it from human people. I got it from a revelation or an unveiling of the reality of Yeshua. So think about this. We wouldn't have the New Testament if it wasn't for ecstasies. Paul had ecstasies. Peter had ecstasies. John had ecstasies. It's a book fueled and nourished by ecstasies. It came from above, taught from God in the realm, in the realm of life. Woohoo! So... The more violent end, rapture, don't be afraid by this anyway. Just it, God's not going to give you rapture if you don't want it. I can tell you that now. They had given a protocol and permission with God through union and walking arm in arm that allowed these higher states. So don't be afraid of this. This is Yahweh. This is your father. This is your daddy. This is this is Jesus, your lover, your, your husband. It's like, how much do you trust them? Because they go, do you trust me? And a lot of the church go, only this much i'll speak in tongues and sing a few songs and the lord's going okay i'll respect that because even heaven functions on honor that's why some churches have a lot of glory some don't because god god is god works through kindness okay now for me personally i want these experiences and i and my language is this i can't live without them why would i i've been having them well consistently now for 16 years and I can't even imagine not having them, having ecstasies and raptures and out and those expanded states. For me, that's life now. That's that's my marriage. That's my marriage to the Lord. That's that's the realm that I walk in. And that's not going to be taken away because I've chosen the better way, which is the way of love, the way of life. And, you know, people can misunderstand it because they see me drunk or intoxicated. But because it's my lover that fills my cup. Yeah, I've made mistakes in how I've talked or acted, but I'll never reject his love and his love wine. His love wine is my life. Okay, so in Revelation 1.10, oh, it's also called, by the way, flight of the spirit. Are we out of time yet? No, we've got a little, we've got 20 minutes left, haven't we? I haven't got very far on my notes. I hope I'm not rambling too much. I'm trying to okay. communicate in a way that's accessible. Is it okay, Liz? It's perfect. Perfect, Justin. It's amazing. Great. Great. So we can see in Revelation 1.10, this is one translation. The GNV says, I was ravished in spirit. I love that. Ravished. That's when the Lord ravishes you. See, we don't realize how violent his love can be. We're so used to the little gentle, gentle edge of it. But that has to end. That, that kind of Christianity has to end. We have to come back to the original design the original pentecostal wine raptures the history of the, the church is the history of raptures and ecstasies every movement the huguenots the jansenites the revivalists william branham kenneth hagan william branham had countless ecstasies kenneth hagan would f function sometimes he writes about this in his book on visions of jesus he says sometimes he would be preaching for 15 minutes at a time not hearing a single word and he'd have to listen to the tape uh, my friend Ian is like that. He will preach a whole message sometimes in a, an ecstasy and he'll listen to the tape afterwards and, or CD or MP3 and write notes on it because he was caught up. And I've had that. I've actually been in an ecstasy once in Horsham where I preached some of my message and I was not there. I was caught up into Jesus and he took me somewhere and taught me about a different subject, showed me the distant future. I went into an expanded state. I was in wonderment and amazement but the whole time i'm standing there just gently talking whilst i'm out of myself and i learned so much in that moment that's another thing from ecstasy it's like intense knowledge packed into a glimmer of light it's like a sunbeam where you see all of eternity it hits you and it goes woof and sometimes i've had ecstasies on airplanes and it's taken me years and years to unpack it in fact, many of my teachings on the podcasts came from ecstasies and the podcast went viral and eventually we had over 5 million downloads. But what people don't realize is what was different about those podcasts is the realm that they came from. I wasn't regurgitating from here. I was, it was coming from here. And to be honest with you, I did it in fear and trembling. I didn't want to be known. 
you know i wasn't really looking for that i was looking for the world to get better that's what motivated me i wanted to see a better world but i found that in union with god he rewards those who diligently seek you seek him he, there's reward for this more reward than you can possibly possibly imagine if we understood this we would give time for this we would make room for this we wouldn't cram our meetings with all the busyness we would make space for union and ascension and love and engage in those realms okay so for some reason the modern church has forgotten this but it's it's so thoroughly biblical 2 corinthians 5 13 paul said i'm besides myself other translations like the passion use better words because the word besides is new is from the king james and it sounds very polite it's like oh i was in church today darling and i was quite besides myself because i felt <laughs> god's love it sounds anglican right but the actual word there is like i was in blissful ecstasy so the passion translation does a much better job it says this if we are out of our minds in a blissful divine ecstasy it is for God. 2 Corinthians 5, 13, the Passion Translation. This is the cool thing. What is Paul saying? He's saying the ecstasy is for God. See, if we want a, a, an ecclesia in our generation that's doing what God wants, God wants to give you ecstasy. That's what he wants. Um, the, the Mirror Translation says this. He delights in our ecstasy. <laughs> This is a cool line. It says, our insane mode is between us and God. So Paul had an insane mode. He said this, we promise to behave ourselves sane and sober before you. So what Paul was saying here was, look, guys, I'm coming to you. I've got a dilemma here. My dilemma is this. I sometimes am blissfully out of my mind before God. But I'm going to try and be sober for you. But if I am out of my mind... And if I'm caught up in an ecstasy, I want you to know this. God delights in my ecstasy. That's the language of Paul, because he was the guy who lived in the mysterion, the mystical. He used the word mystery more than anyone else. Christ, the mysterion in you. Marriage being the mysterion of Christ and the church. Mysterion is the word the Bible uses for mystery, but it means this, a mystical secret that can only be understood above. You can't see it here. It's too big. It's too glorious. It's too incomprehensible. You have to go up into the realm of light and the realm of love to see it. Let's just switch a second and I'll just have a little interlude here and I'm going to show you some of the church history. So I'm going to do a screen share with you guys. You know, Martin Luther said the gospel is nothing less than laughter and joy. That's the great reformer. C.S. Lewis said joy is the most serious business of heaven. Roland Buck, who was taken up to heaven for six months once in a moment of time, said that joy was what heaven was all about. And it was far more relaxed than we thought. OK, so this is the history of the church. You know, when it when Pentecost broke out, we've had different mystical movements from the Desert Fathers. This is Anthony of Egypt. If you've not read early in Christian lives by the book early Christian lives these guys he once was in a 20-year ecstasy where he didn't even leave his cell which was his, his his house and they just fed him bread and water every day and he birthed in the spirit our age he warred over us he saw our age the age of the saints the age of glory and they had such magnetism on them that even the emperors wrote to Saint Anthony of Egypt the, the desert started to bloom because so many people went into the desert and started to live in that realm and grow food there and really engage powerfully in the kingdom realm. Now, we can skip ahead. There's so many movements. I've been here. This is the island of Iona. It's in Scotland. If you've never been there, it is so profoundly mystical. Anyway, Columba lived there and he would have ecstasies where light would come out of his room in one ecstasy his house was lit up for three days where every crack and every cranny was lit up he came out of there after three days singing new songs knowing new hymns and he said i saw all of eternity in a sunbeam these guys could change the weather stop plagues angels would come and tell him who to anoint as king the king of britain got saved because of them 
Another one, Cuthbert. Now this is the island of Lindisfarne. He would go into ecstasies at night and stand in the cold, freezing water all night long. I've been to Lindisfarne. I've stood in the water. I've stood where he stood and he would be taken up in ecstasies and raptures and he would bring such wisdom. This is the thing, all the ecstatics carried wisdom. They weren't just whacked. Francis of Assisi, he gave up his richness to help the poor, started a new movement that's still changing the world, engaging animals, engaging the poor, and but yet he lived in ecstasies. He would have trances and his first disciple, St. Bernard, would get lost for days in the forest. But Francis of Assisi is the first one we read about that bore the wounds of the Lord after seeing the Lord. When he had the encounter with Jesus where he was given the wounds, the whole mountain lit up at night and was seen by people from miles around. He tried to hide the wounds, but he couldn't. He, he got wounded by love. He was 42. Then we have people like Catherine of Siena who started to have visions when she was seven. She saw Gabriel, Michael, John the Baptist, Jesus, and she was an incredible mystic. She couldn't eat food because it would make her sick. So she hardly ate anything. She only slept an hour a night. She would levitate up the stairs and she was a doctor of the church. So popes would consult her. People of wisdom would consult her. She would multiply wine, multiply food. And she was only a young girl. She died young. She also had the wounds. If you look at this picture, you can see the wounds on her hand. This has been a consistent sign with people who love the Lord on, in this way. Joan of Arc, she, she helped the King of France beat Britain and push back England. And she said, my banner is mightier than my sword. On her banner, she had the Holy Spirit. And she had visions of Gabriel, Gabriel ecstasies with Michael. She got downloads and strategies on warfare. She died a martyr. They killed her for dressing like a man, which was terrible. But she lived an empowered life where she followed the vision of God. One of my favourite, Teresa of Avila, this statue, I want to go and see it one day, it's beautiful. The other side of this statue is an angel piercing Teresa's heart. She went into what was called incendia memoris, the burning heart of love. She writes about it in a journal. She would frequently levitate. They tried, she tried to hide it. But sometimes there's a funny story where she, they had a visiting nuns come and she told her nuns, I don't want to be seen levitated, so make sure it doesn't happen. She went into an ecstasy in the song and all the nuns jumped on her and yet she still levitated. It's so funny. In a journal, it says, despite the nuns jumping on me, my levitation was still observed. In other words, the pull of heaven was so strong, even all the bodies of the nuns couldn't keep her on the ground. Can you imagine what that was like? That's in the 1500s. Marina de Escobar, she was ill, but God would pull her out of her bed in ecstasies. Angels would plunge her into the divine ocean, into the river of bliss. She'd be taken up into the high tower, the mountains, and she would see bigger and bigger versions of God, bigger truths of God, bigger revelations of God, all from her bed when she was sick. Joseph of Cupertino, one of my favorite saints, he used to levitate. He's levitating here. He was a profound ecstatic. He had ecstasies day after day over and over again on average you would spend three hours a day levitating in ecstasy he had so many ecstasies he was banned from public communion he was banned from the choir for 30 years but he had incredible wisdom would work miracles wonders then we have the great awakenings this is jonathan edwards and his wife sarah we know some of his messages but sarah was absolutely an ecstatic she would be caught up sometimes they'd have hundreds of people in ecstasy all at once jonathan edwards said this that they were more like the drunken rabble than the worshippers of god but he said if this is madness i wish all the world would be mad his wife sarah would have so many ecstasies they'd have to carry her home and put her to bed in her clothes and this is the great awakening that changed america then you have William Booth and the Salvation Army exploding out on the streets, touching the poor. But William Booth would frequently have ecstasies, wrote whole reams of visions of God. They had so many people have ecstasies in their meetings. They used to have beds on the wall. In some churches, layers of beds to lie down the bodies of the people who were slain in the spirit. Then you have Mariah Ordotheta. Her ecstasies were legendary. She froze in this position for three whole days with a finger raised in the air. And she would have breakouts that would go 17 miles, 
20 miles. The biggest breakout she had of ecstasies and tra trances was 50 mile radius. It says people were struck in their homes, they were struck in the pubs, they were struck in the business places, and it was transformational. Whole communities turned to God. You have other people like Gemma Galgani. She was a young girl, hidden, but she would have profound ecstasies. If you can get her book, it's a wonderful book. She'd often have the wounds of the Lord in ecstasy, but when she came out of the ecstasy, the wounds would instantly heal and disappear. And this was witnessed by many, many people. She died at a young age too. You have the modern age there, modern missions with Sundar Singh. He would have 10 ecstasies a month where he'd be taken out of his body, being shown world events, being taken by saints and angels. And he wrote whole books on conversations with Jesus. He was one of the greatest missionaries of his generation. And then go through to the modern age, William Branham, who would constantly be caught up in these trances. He would be so out of it, he couldn't feel his hands, he couldn't move, he had to be carried out of meetings. Sometimes they'd have to drive him round for hours for him to come around, but thousands upon thousands were healed with irrefutable proofs of the resurrection. He operated in a realm of glory. I could have talked about so many more, I could have talked about um, Kenneth Hagen, I could have talked about Bob Jones, Paul Kane, I could have talked about so many different movements. What I've discovered is you cannot separate ecstasis from the gospel. The gospel is wine, the gospel is bliss, the gospel is joy. Oh, wow, 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 wow. <laughs> wow, wow. When I put together that slideshow, I had to cut out so many because I could have gone through every, probably every century. And you know, we wouldn't be here today if it wasn't for this. Even Azusa Street was birthed out of, you know, um, William J. Seymour putting his head under a box, <laughs> caught up in the heavens. And Frank Bartleman, who was the intercessor for that, he would have incredible raptures, all night ecstasies where Jesus would stand alongside him. Evan Roberts, John G. Lake. John G. Lake would have out of body healing ministry where he would be taken out. He was taken out of his body once in front of loads of people, flew thousands of miles from South Africa to Wales, went into hospital and healed a woman they were praying for. She got healed from that moment. This is documented. He was able to describe the door knocker. He was able to describe, describe the building, the location, what it looked like. He went in there. She saw him. She was tied up because they were praying for her because her parents lived in South Africa or whatever. And she got healed when she saw John G. Lake. And it took two weeks for the letter to get to John G. Lake. But from the moment he walked through the room in a bi-location, she was healed. Wow. Oh. So I'll end with this because I'm just getting so wrecked by God's desire for us. We've lived so small. Paul struggled to put this into human language. 2 Corinthians 12, 4. I was the subject of an incomprehensible ecstasy with two truths too great for human language were imparted to me. Truths too great for human language. And this is what he said, in such a man, I will boast. And I'm gonna end it there guys and say, in such a man, I will boast. I will boast in the ecstasies of God because we've seen nothing yet. And I believe, I'm gonna just speak to you now, Liz. I believe you are a prototype to help transition the charismatic move back into the ecstasies, back into the mystical, back into that. And God's created you to be a bridge, a bridge. And the many are going to go because there's nowhere else to go. I feel like, and some of you will feel this, there's a word for you. God's blocked all the other ways. There's no other way forward other than through the narrow path of love. And the narrow path of love is going to birth the next age. And that's the age of light, illumination, immortality. And it's coming through the logic of love. I love you guys. Um, yeah. I hardly scratched the surface of that message, but I hope Amazing. you caught some of it. And just to say, if you've got more questions than answers, don't be frustrated. Treasure those questions and do what we did at the start of the session. Breathe. Gently move into it. Position yourself. If you don't have an ecstasy, that's fine. Just position yourself for love. And, you know, when I used to go into union, I forgot about ecstasies. I spent three years enjoying union and I, I forgot God gave me raptures. And then one day I was enjoying union with God and he, he raptured me and I was shocked. And I came out of the rapture and I said to God, 
I forgot that you do that to people. <laughs> I'd be so enjoying holding his hand every day. We were like two old people on a park bench, just enjoying the scenery. And I lived like that continually for three years. And then God went poof and took me up. And But by then I'd forgotten about those stuff because I'd found what I was looking for. I had found mystical union or the prayer of simplicity. That's one of the highest forms of prayer that we can have. Thanks for listening, guys. Over to you, Liz. Oh, Justin, you're amazing. Oh, my goodness. You just, <laughs> ah, such a magnificent articulation of the deeper life, hey, and, and where we're all going. You know, I love it because Jesus has so called you and mandated you and enabled you to see the future, yeah. like to see his original blueprint for, for our expression of life. This is normal Christianity. And when yeah. you guys just getting wrecked watching, like this is our family. This is yeah. the big cloud of witnesses that surrounds us. Yeah. And I love what you said, Justin, like every single move of God that has ever gone, ever happened on planet Earth. Yeah has been birthed out of ecstasies and encounters and and the way that you know the lord the, there's a scripture actually i just want to read to you it's um where jesus says i am the light of the world whoever follows me will never walk in darkness but will have the light of life mm. you know and as we entangle into our union like you were saying justin as we just breathe him in and recenter into the truth that we already are in union it's our union right that enables encounters as we do that we're in, we're entangling into the light Light of life where yeah. all truth then begins to infuse into us right we open our heart and we wow. see god <laughs> and then like you do justin you know this is the way now and this is we're going to find this in our lives more and more and more now that yeah. we everything we speak everything we encourage each other and empower each other with every yeah. message that's brought is going to come from encounter we're going to live from the union it's not going to be head knowledge through study i mean i love i could to study and mine the scriptures but yeah really this is the time we're in now where everything is impartation mm. from the union from the entanglement and there's how oh, <laughs> oh my goodness you're amazing justin thank you for bringing such a powerful message mm.